If you really want a true classic tattoo, you'll have to go back in time and cross the Pacific. That's where you'd find a man with a white t-shirt, an oily gray pompadour, and ink splattered Frisco jeans. Known to all as Norman Keith, Sailor Jerry Collins. He's the man many see as the master of the deftly crafted, boldly lined, balls forward old school tattoo. The kind fueled by the devil may care appetites of men far away from home. He's the man who took these classic designs, known as Flash, and incorporated the Asiatic styles born from his years of travel on the high seas. To a generation of tattooers, he's simply just the man. Old Ironsides, Hori Smoku, Sailor Jerry. Sailor Jerry Collins. You can't beat him. Pure, down to earth tattoo artist. They called him a master of tattooing, and it was true. He took American designs, elaborated on them, made them his own. The standard that you've got to be up with nowadays. Light years ahead of most of the tattooers. He traveled around the country as a lot of young guys did, kind of bumming around on boxcars. It was a sort of adventure. It was like pre-Beatnik, pre-Jack Kerouac on the road stuff. Yeah, that's where he started tattooing. He claimed he was tattooing by hand with, you know, handheld needles and whatever he could get for ink. And then he hit the Great Lakes area. And Jerry learned to tattoo in the Chicago area. And they told him, well, the way you'll learn to tattoo is you, we tattoo stiffs at first. And they took Jerry down, got him in the morgue to tattoo a stiff. Well, the guy he tattooed was not really dead. When Jerry started to tattoo him, the guy started howling. <laughs> yeah. You know, there wasn't that many real creative tattooers in those days. It was a secret world. It was a really, really subterranean, outsider kind of an art. You'd hit a brick wall when you wanted to talk to somebody and you wanted to be a tattoo artist. How could I learn this? Because you all get me $250. So I went and I robbed the grocery store instead. And I gave the man the $250 and I became a tattoo artist. I never looked back. It was definitely a subculture. And tattooing in those days became a real working class thing. And then it particularly became a thing that the people in the, in the armed forces were getting especially sailors. If you're in a situation where everybody has to be exactly the same, you live in exactly the same quarters, you dress exactly the same, it's a process of identity, it's individuation, like I'm going to say who I am via this tattoo. Jerry was a merchant sailor. The sea, I think, was the overriding thing with Jerry, and he relished the sort of, of course, macho environment of it. Guys would return with tattoos, and they, they were like heroes. And the whole freedom of exploring the Pacific and then visiting these exotic ports because he had been to China, he'd sailed the China Sea, he'd been to Japan, he'd been to all these, these places in Asia, which fed his fascination with an appreciation of really Asian aesthetics. He talked about going down to Tahiti when the girls all still ran around half naked, like that. But he loved the Pacific and I believe that he got to Hawaii in maybe the late 20s, something like that, and essentially then stayed home-based in Honolulu his entire life. He loved Hawaii. He never budged once he found Hawaii. Before World War II, Hawaii was a, a relatively underpopulated place. But when the Japanese bombed the place December 7, 1941, suddenly it was the heartland. Americans are remembering with vengeance in their hearts. Avenge December the 7th. On to victory. You can imagine what it was like for a million soldiers and sailors to show up on this, this rock, as they call it. They were not like looking for elegant, pretty, cute entertainment. And there was a whole district set up just for these soldiers and sailors. It was called the Hotel Street District. Chinatown Hotel Street was the main action center. It was a place where anything went. And it was catered to these soldiers and sailors. And they went there to get tattooed. There were more tattoo shops on Hotel Street. Every other store was a tattoo shop. These shops were swamped with people. They were like supermarkets and people were just jamming tattoos on. From morning to night, just constant, constant. Hotel Street was a great place. There'd be lines of guys down the street for the shops they thought were the best. And there was Sailor Jerry, of course. A lot of the thing about when you're in a dangerous thing, a military thing, the tattoo is that this is our last fling, we're gonna do this, or our first fling, our first real liberty. So it was a jumping off place. And they'd all beg you, oh, just tattoo me with whatever you got. It was crazy. 
Jerry tattooed in some of the arcades and then eventually opened his own shop, 1033 Smith. And this is where he really made his mark on, on tattoo history. It was flash, every corner that could be flashed. It was just big enough for two stations. It was very, very tight. That was the shot. That was Sailor Jerry's. When he got into tattooing, he had a terrific natural talent for drawing. He was a self-taught guy, an autodidact. He was a real smart kind of a guy, kind of a nerd in a way. He was super interested in, in electronics. He built me a, a power supply one time. We're going to fix you up with a power supply. It looked like a bomb. I used to have a lot of trouble bringing it on airplanes. One thing that was very important about Jerry is that he, his attention to detail, the rigging had to be right. Probably the only tattooers I ever met that knew what all that stuff was when he tattooed it. He was a great shitster. He was well over six feet tall. He wasn't afraid of nothing. He wasn't like a Pollyanna guy. Took his own teeth out when they went bad. Take a chopstick and hit it with a hammer. He had a dark view of life. He really reflected that in his flesh. And he was a great one for slogans. He was a, a really <laughs> Oh, he was just so full of pranks. You know, he would have these very funny things, these cartoons with really tongue-in-cheek kind of sarcastic remarks. And there's a tradition of that among tattooing anyway. I mean, he just had a flair for it with, with a sense of humor that was unparalleled. So Jerry had this, this radio show. It was called Old Ironsides. He was a terrific, like, raconteur. He could tell stories and he could relate with people on tons of different levels. And it was amazing to see him switch gears, a real chameleon, a social chameleon. He valued freedom with a capital F. He was extremely anti-government. He was a real strong libertarian. He chased more than one hippie out of there. In the old days, there maybe were six or eight people that Jerry really respected and worshipped. He began developing more ambitious projects and had some contacts from some of the famous Tokyo tattoo artists. He really got down on the Asian thing. Horiyoshi was real cloistered. He wouldn't have anything to do with those guys, but did he ever like Jerry? He saw some of Jerry's work and he saw color like he'd never seen them. Jerry's connection with Japan, it was interesting because he went through World War II, he, he really was, he, he had a love-hate thing, but he respected Japan enough that he wanted to get close to it, he studied it, he studied the stories, but the undercurrent was, we're going to learn this and we're going to beat them at their own game. The look that Jerry really got famous for and made a huge impact is that he decided to get more and more devoted to fusing in the Japanese look. So this had a terrific impact. People saw those photos and thought, oh my God, this guy, you know, he just was pushing the envelope. He was doing sort of his version of Japanese work, but with an American flair, a different kind of a thing to it. And it was blowing minds of people all over the world. Wait a minute, tattooing can be like that? What Sailor Jerry was able to do was be influenced by Japanese art but make it his own. And that's what's so hard to do nowadays. The possibility 